You've noticed an interesting pattern in the way that the deserts are distributed on the surface of the Earth. Specifically, you've noticed that they seem to be clustered near 30 degrees north latitude and 30 degrees south latitude. And you think to yourself, why? Is there some reason for this? And we do have an explanation. It comes down to large-scale circulation patterns of the atmosphere, specifically circulation patterns that we call Hadley cells. And so that's what we're going to be exploring and discussing today, Hadley cells, how they form, and why they're responsible for deserts being at 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. And the first thing that we'll need to think about is the differential heating of the surface of the Earth. So differential heating is one very important thing. And another thing that we'll need to think about and keep in mind is that when air rises, it loses its moisture. So rising air loses moisture. These two things combined will help us to understand why we have deserts at 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. So let's discuss this differential heating. I'm going to scroll down now. And here I've drawn a representation of the Earth with the equator and 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. And these arrows represent sunlight, radiation from the sun reaching the Earth. So you probably know that the equator and the tropics are warmer than the poles. And the reason is that there's differential heating of the Earth's surface. When sunlight falls on the surface of the Earth, the places where it's most direct at the equator in the tropics, you get warmer conditions. And the reason is that there's more energy falling per unit area at the equator and near the tropics than at the poles, because the sunlight's more direct here. And at the poles, it's more spread out. So let's think about how this differential heating is going to affect the atmosphere. So we're going to zoom in on a region near the equator. And I'm going to draw for you a square here. And I'll color it red. And this square will represent a mass of air. And what you'll find is that when you learn about weather and climate, that oftentimes you'll learn about masses of air and how masses of air move around on the surface of the Earth, how they interact with each other, and the properties of those masses of air, and maybe how those properties change over time. And these things will help you understand weather and climate on, on larger scales. So we're going to do that here. So we have this mass of air at the equator, and I've colored it red. It's warmer because it's where the Earth receives the most radiation, the most direct solar radiation. So we have warm air, and warm air rises. It's the same reason that uh, a warm air, a hot air balloon rather, will rise because the flame heats the air inside of it, which becomes less dense, and then, then the surrounding air, and then the buoyant force will lift it up. It'll cause it to rise. And so the same thing happens to this air near the equator. And so this air will rise. And as it rises, it cools down. It cools. So I'm going to change the color to blue to represent it cooling down. And when this mass of air cools, the moisture inside of it, the water vapor, will condense and it will fall as rain. So we have a mass of air that was warm, it rises, it cools, and the rain will fall from it onto the equator. So at the equator we have lots of moisture, lots of rainfall, and we find our tropical rainforests. Now, this air that just rose leaves a gap, and this gap needs to be filled. So air from the north and from the south will migrate in to fill this vacancy left by the other air. Now back to this air that rose up and cooled, what will it do next? Will it continue to rise and move away from the Earth forever? Well, we know that's not what happens because the Earth has an atmosphere. It hasn't lost it over time. Other places like Mars, we think, lost the atmosphere over time. But the Earth has not. And so 
this air will do something else. The air will migrate north or south. So it'll either go north or it'll go south. Because that's the only place it really has to go, because this air filled in beneath it. Now let's think about this mass of air that moved in. Well, it's at the equator now, receiving more solar radiation, and so it's going to warm up. I'll turn it red to represent that. And then we know that warm air rises and cools and loses its moisture. And then this air will fill in. And so you've probably noticed that we've got this pattern. We're setting up a pattern here, a large-scale circulation pattern in the atmosphere. And so let's go ahead and draw this now using some lines. So we have air that rises at the equator, migrates north in the northern hemisphere, descends back down, and then migrates back to the equator. And in the south, it rises and then migrates south, descends, and then back to the equator. And here what I've drawn, these these are Hadley cells. So these are Hadley cells. It's this specific circulation pattern that we call uh, Hadley cells. So this is happening all across the Earth's surface in a band. So I've just drawn a cross section here, but imagine that it's happening at every place all around the globe. So we'll draw it face on here, just so that you can see that. So we have a couple of masses of air that we'll think about. And these masses of air are warm because they're, they're at the equator, and they will rise up. So in this case, out of the screen or towards you. And I'll change them blue to represent them cooling. They lose their moisture. The rain falls at the equator. And then these masses of air will migrate north or they'll migrate south. Now you might be wondering, why doesn't the air just go all the way to the pole before descending? Why doesn't the air do this? Why doesn't it rise at the equator and then migrate all the way up to the pole before descending and then going all the way back to the equator? Why, isn't, why don't we have this large circulation pattern? And the reason is that as the air migrates, it's deflected. It's deflected by something called the Coriolis effect, which works on any rotating frame of reference. So the Earth is spinning. That's what causes day and night. And so anything that's moving along the surface will be deflected. And so these masses of air will be deflected. And it, they'll def they're deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere. And they're deflected to the left in the southern hemisphere. And this concept will be discussed in more detail in another video. So we have these, these pattern of the air rising at the equator, migrating north or south, and then descending. So let's go ahead and put this whole puzzle together. So we have a warm mass of air at the equator that rises up, loses its moisture because it cools, rain falls at the equator, and then migrates north or south. And then these masses of air that are now dry will descend on 30 south and 30 north. And they descend at that latitude based on how quickly the Earth is spinning and the strength of the Coriolis effect. And so what we have is at 30 north and at 30 south, descending masses of air from aloft that are dry, that carry with them very little moisture. And so we have lots of dry air at these specific latitudes. And so this dry air leads to the deserts being at 30 north and 30 south. 